Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for coming to the Information Chessing for the Communication Leadership Graduate Program. My name is Hanson Hussein. Um, I'm the director of the program. I'm joined by my colleagues, Anita, Kim, Molly, and Allison back there. And that's Jessica on the camera. We are, I'm using this microphone because it's not projecting my voice, but because hopefully there are people who are watching via live stream as well, for those who couldn't make it. And so this is our opportunity to give you a little bit of a face to face understanding of what our program is about. Um, but more importantly, take some time to answer your questions. Um, so we'll speak for about 20 to 30 minutes uh, to lay out the program and the value it brings to people who go through it. And then we will spend the rest of the time answering all your questions, both online and offline. Um, so I just wanted to start by giving you a sense of, of what the program is about. Um, I'm really grateful that you decided to spend the end of your day here with us. And I thought the best way to actually tell you the story of what we do and the values that we bring to uh, students who are in the program, we tell you my day and the three things that happened to me today, which I think really encompass um, uh, the role that our program plays and the value that we have in our community. So the first thing is that this morning I had a meeting with the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. And this is the chief lawyer in charge of criminal justice in our region. Um, and they asked me to help advise them and hire a new director of communications uh, for that particular office. And so we've had a relationship with them for a number of years. In fact, this person who was in charge of such an important role in our city actually was a client in one of our classes a few years ago. And one of our alums works for him now too. And so this really demonstrates um, the, the, the sort of the stature that our communication leadership has right now in our community. Um, we actually handed out to those who are, who are here, we handed out this sheet to all of you that explains, I think, the gist of what you get from communication leadership. And I'm going to allude to some of that in my opening remarks. But in terms of that relationship, it's basically the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office wants to learn how to tell meaningful stories that inspire change, which is exactly the thing it says right up there. And so they basically recognize that as lawyers who are involved in criminal justice every day, that uh, to really make, um, to connect to their public and to their constituents, they weren't telling stories properly. And so they came to us, a graduate program, to sort of help them do that. And so that's, that's one meaningful relationship, and that's what I did this morning. In fact, if they're consulting with us in terms of the person they want to hire for their next director of communications, they pretty much clearly said, we want to hire somebody similar to what you, uh, similar, similar to what your graduates do in your program. And so they're very much looking for that entrepreneurial mindset. Somebody who can tell stories, somebody who can convene communities, and who doesn't look at it as a traditional media job, but as a way to truly connect to the constituents so that they can understand this very complicated but very important subject. So after that, uh, I was downtown, and I went over to the Seattle uh, Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce. And I'm on the board of trustees for that organization. This is the entity that represents businesses in the Pacific North, in the Seattle area, and their interests. And I've been on their board for a number of years. And in fact, I was introduced to the Seattle Chamber of Commerce through one of our students who was working there at the time. And we co-hosted a couple of events on social and digital media with them over the years. Uh, I'm also involved with helping them find their new CEO. And so it shows you, in that instance, that um, in terms of how we connect to the businesses in this region, and as you may know, Seattle is the fastest growing city in the United States. Um, and, uh, there's almost zero unemployment right now. And many of our students are being recruited even when they're during, in the program because there's so many jobs in our, in our community. And, that, and that, that sort of that relationship with the Seattle Chamber of Commerce um, refers to the last bullet point on that sheet. Basically, we are in one of the hottest job markets in the world, and we have years of influence in that hot job market. Um, they, companies and organizations and uh, local governments come to us on a regular basis, two or three times a week sometimes, with job openings saying, hey, um, we really would like it if you could refer some of your students or graduates to us because we're looking for this very specific thing. And so for us to actually exert influence with the um, organization that has the best connections to a lot of the major and smaller companies in this region, and for them to seek our advice and our guidance, allows us to not only exert that influence, but also to hear back from those companies and organizations in terms of what are they looking for, and is our curriculum aligned with that? And that's something that we do on a regular basis to make sure that happens. So the last thing that I did is that um, I came back to the university finally, because we're out there, we're very much community-facing as opposed to a university pro program, university-facing program, and I met my wonderful colleagues, Anita, Molly, Alex, and Akin, 
and talk about this amazing program that we're running this year in collaboration with uh, somebody who donated money from us from Japan to talk about how we can tell stories better on behalf of the ocean. Essentially, this organization is really concerned about um, ocean health and climate change. And they said, well, all the stories that we've seen so far, all the documentaries have really, they told really impactful emotional stories, but we haven't seen much change. And since you're an organization and a, a graduate program that focuses on storytelling for change, is there any way that you can help us advocate on behalf of the ocean? So this year, a good number of our students, in addition to taking classes in the program, are actually also coming up with a, a whole campaign and an approach to thinking about how we can uh, establish our connection here in the Pacific Northwest with the ocean, and can we tell better stories and support organizations in this region to tell better stories about the ocean so that people can connect to it in a more meaningful way. So that gets to this idea that we are creating partnerships with high profile organizations to elevate the classroom experience by providing students with real world problems to solve in their coursework. It's something that has always been um, the baseline for our graduate program, recognizing that communication um, and digital media and community building and all the things that we talk about and teach in our program are moving so fast. We definitely have to be out there in the so-called real world collaborating and supporting organizations that align with our interests to make sure that um, they're getting some more expertise and the students in our program are actually getting some of that experience on the ground because there's only so much of this you can learn out of textbooks and we recognize that those relationships are where, where we're going to really provide valuable experience to our students. And so those are just three sort of little opportunistic encounters I have today that really demonstrate how connected we are to both um, our partners and to the subject matter as well. Um, and that really you know, speaks to what our mission statement is. It's something we're very proud of. Uh, and I'll just read it out to you a couple of times so you can really get a sense of what it is. It is, we are a connected learning community, fearlessly tackling challenges through creative stories that spark change. Take one more time, please. good. And I'll make sure the camera gets it. We are a connected learning community, fearlessly tackling challenges through creative stories that spark change. You know, obviously, the students who come to our program are seeking personal and professional transformation. But what we've noticed, especially now, is that um, a lot of our community members are really thinking about, yes, I want to do very well professionally, but I also want to change my world around me in a positive way. And we had a record number of applications this year. And what we've heard from the students who are now in the 17th cohort of our program is that this is, uh, that we came here, we moved here from around the world or across the country, or we live here in Seattle, and we came to this program so that we can actually have a positive impact. We see what's happening elsewhere in this country, we see what's happening in Europe, and we recognize that, yes, as globalization and technology is really disrupting everything, and, and what we advocate is that communication itself and storytelling can be the way that we inspire and support people to think about how do we overcome this disruption, how do we adapt to this change, and can we, as communicators, play the role of sense makers? Can we lead people to adaptation that actually gets us past what seems to be pretty chaotic to that next stage? And we think that communication plays that fundamental role. So much so that in terms of what we recommend to our partners and to students in terms of reading, um, this is not required reading in our program, but um, Thomas Friedman wrote this book called, uh, this year called Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist Guide to Thriving in what he calls the Age of Acceleration which basically means that technology and, and some of the disruptions that are happening are beginning to pile up on each other. And so the world is moving faster than ever. And that puts people really very much in a state of anxiety. And so you're seeing some of the decisions we're making at the political and economic level because of that. And Friedman also says the same thing, that really to combat that kind of anxiety, we have to think about how we can lead people into a state of um, building really meaningful connections amongst their neighbors, amongst their community, and within their network, so that they can actually feel resilient and actually start solving some of these problems. And he doesn't say it, but we do, that communication is at the center of solving those problems. Um, a more important book for us that um, was required reading for all our incoming students this year is Hitmakers, The Science of Popularity in an Age of Distraction. So Friedman calls it an age of acceleration. Derek Thompson calls it an age of distraction. It's an age of something, no matter who you're reading. And, um, and, and we love this book. Uh, we actually had Derek Thompson come and guest lecture in Anita's class this fall. 
Um, we had an event with him a few weeks ago, and you can actually watch some of that content online soon. Um, and basically, Derek Thompson talks about how we are very much in this remarkable age of abundance around content, so much so that it's actually very hard to get people to pay attention, especially for professionals who are trying to communicate. And so he actually uh, did, a, uh, did a lot of research in thinking about, well, what makes for successful content in this age of distraction? And, and, and to sum it up, it basically comes down to something he calls a familiar surprise. That people want to, um, they want to learn something new, they want to be advanced in their knowledge, but they don't want it to be so new that they can't recognize it. That from an evolutionary point of view, humans are, uh, are technically afraid of something that's unknown because it might kill them, like a snake and you don't know what venom they have. And so we want a little bit of that familiarity so we know that we can cope with it, but we also want to advance ourselves and grow. And so Derek Thompson does an amazing job of really explaining that that's the kind of storytelling that has to happen if you want to operate in this really sort of pretty complex communication ecosystem right now. Um, and which is why we basically decided to use this as a, as a book and, and students have very much enjoyed it. And we definitely recommend to anybody who wants to understand what it means to tell stories in this particular age. Kind of refer to my notes here. So uh, for us, there's, you know, uh, we're, we're, of course, we say this, but in terms of where we are with communication and where the world is going right now, we can't think of a better time to actually be in a program like communication leadership where um, where we're, we have 600 alumni who live around the world. We have community partnerships and organizations and companies and really influential entities that are in relationship with us who recognize that communication lies at the heart of a lot of the change that we're seeing right now. In terms of our students being hired, uh, in, you see that the, the sheet that we handed out, our students are being hired in, in, a, in a remarkable uh, diversity of capacities with a great number of different organizations. And you can see some of the logos of where our graduates work. Adobe, Amazon, Facebook, Starbucks, and the private sector to King County, uh, I mentioned King County Prosecutor's Attorney's Office, Seattle Children's Hospital, Pacific Science Center, REI, Microsoft, Spotify, T-Mobile. That's just a smatter of the different types of companies where our, our students are finding work. And, and it really is, um, it runs the sort of gamut in terms of what organizations are looking for. They definitely hear us when we say it's storytelling is a hard communication right now. And so a lot of these companies and organizations are looking to hire storytellers, people who can actually leverage and create content to further the needs and objectives of these organizations. They're looking for content strategists, and they're looking for experience, user experience designers. Uh, they're looking for communication specialists. And it's not just people working in PR and marketing. There are people who are working in the sciences who recognize that communication is at the heart of that. So it's just a wonderful time to be in this field. And especially here in Seattle, we're finding that there's a huge demand for people from our program. And many people who do move here from the United States, or from elsewhere in the country or elsewhere in the world have found that they prefer to stay in Seattle because there are a huge number of opportunities here. And we go out of our way to make sure that we can connect our students to those opportunities. Molly, who's our head of partnerships, puts out a weekly email in terms of the amount of jobs that are available. And we, we mentor people in terms of how they can make applications and usually have contact with organizations. So that's, that's sort of the gist of the program and where we are right now. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you before I turn it over to my colleagues is really uh, the breakdown because the communication leadership program is actually, um, it has two degrees. I'm just gonna show you the slide that's also on the back of the sheet that I handed out for those who are in here. So we have a master's of uh, communication and digital media and we have a master's in communication in the communities and networks. I think it's worth reading out the distinction of that. So the master of communication in digital media is a professional degree focused on communication strategy that emphasizes content creation skills, emerging technologies, and platforms. Students learn to craft intelligent engagement strategies using media production, distribution of content, and analytics. So that's the digital media masters. The Master's in Communities and Networks is also a professional degree, which is also focused on communication strategy, but this one emphasizes building community, growing networks, and crafting organizational identity. Students learn to build collaborative skills necessary to manage change, recognize and navigate interpersonal dynamics, and design effective strategies for engaging with diverse publics. So one is, um, you know, the digital media degree definitely has content at its heart and how you create and design that content and leverage it. Well, the communities and networks is looking uh, a lot of communication and interpersonal connections and what you do 
to actually further that. There's definitely crossover between both of them, as you've heard, and storytelling is definitely the sort of common denominator that lies between them. Um, and what we, we often, uh, when students are considering applying, we, we definitely can guide you uh, in terms of making that decision, but we're also quite flexible. Once you're in the program, you get a chance to take classes in both degrees to a certain number of credits. And there are some students who have actually opted to get both degrees because they actually want the opportunity to take all those that diversity of classes. So it's a it's a it's a wonderful distinction. It's a wonderful way to understand who you are in this in this world, in this profession, and how to actually um, guide yourself through the learning experience. Yeah. And Alex is coming back. Or you? I'm gonna go up here. Right up. Well, who's not here on the ceiling? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Somebody who's really trying to get into the program right now. <laughs> Um, so that is just to give you a high level overview um, and, and show you what we're thinking about and how we're connected. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to my colleague. Are we going to Molly and Alex or are we going to either one? Because Alex is not sure. Sure, we can go. Yeah, can we go with you guys? Yeah. 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 So I'd like to introduce you to my co directors, um, Ken and Anita. And they actually teach the, we have two uh, core classes in the program that all the co students must take. Uh, Anita teaches the one in, in fall in personal narrative and leadership, and, and Ken teaches the one in the spring, which is around organizational storytelling. So I will hand the microphone to you. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. Thanks for being here. So what Ken and I are going to do now for just a couple minutes is, as Hanson said, focus a little bit on the curricular uh, dimensions of our two graduate degrees. And what I'd like to draw attention to is that if you haven't had a chance to visit the curricular pages, which is under classes um, on our website, it's a very rich place to get us a real window into the kind of courses that we offer. Every class that's been on offer for at least the last year, more than a year and a half, you can search, you can search by the professor's name, you can search by the, by the actual degree. And so I encourage you to not only take a chance to get a, that overview, but you're, you're also able to drill down and get a very extended description of that class, and in many cases also see the student testimonial. So for those of you that might be trying to decide between am I MCM, am I MCCM, one of the things that I like to recommend is to go on to the curricular page of our website and really do that audit for yourself of the classes and make note of the ones that really appeal to you. And that's often a great way to determine for yourself which degree you might lean more toward. Um, as Hanson said, though, there are two classes outside of the electives that we do prescribe when you take them and what you take. Otherwise, it's actually a very flexible degree in terms of your timeline and the courses that you opt to to pursue, but we do feel that as a graduate program that is looking to create a sense of unity and a shared um, uh, a shared vocabulary when it comes to what we mean by communication leadership, we felt that in the design of the curriculum, having these two core classes was a way to not only build that sense of the blended cohort between the MCCM and the MCDM, but also help us to explore the way that we think about the core tenets of the curriculum, communication, leadership, and storytelling specifically in the form of these two core classes. So for instance, all of you future cohort eight years potentially would take my class in the fall, COM 536, which is a course that also goes by the title um, leadership, story, leadership Through Story and Community, Creativity and the Digital Age. And I'll let Ken talk a little bit about her course in the spring, but as a segue before that, let me just give you a window into what my fall core class covers and then Kim will pick up that thread and explain how we then marry it to the, to the second core class. So this class, as I said, is a, is a blended class. All MCDM and MCCM students have this class together. And we meet in the fall quarter. And the emphasis of this class is to really look at how we as a program define leadership and how we look at the way in which people's personal narratives and core values influence vocations and their career paths and how we take those core values and consider them in the larger context of communication. What does it mean to communicate as a leader? What does it mean within your particular sector or area of interest to be somebody who leads from all levels? Because we very much believe as a program, this is not a C-suite leadership uh, graduate degree. This is very much one that considers leadership to be a core competency that no matter what sector you pursue, no matter where you fall in the arc of your career trajectory, that you are going to be asked to lead. And that when we consider the idea of leadership in my fall core class, we're really looking at it as mastering particular skills when it comes to creative problem solving and very strong emphasis on being a critical thinker. 
that we see these as two core competencies that are going to serve you very well, not only in our graduate program, but throughout your professional career. And so, for instance, in my class, we will be considering particular individuals in terms of case studies as a way of discussing our own our own lived experiences of leadership. So I have the students looking at all kinds of leaders in various fields, from architects to musicians to technologists, with the idea being that solving communication challenges is something that any individual is going to need to be able to respond to and to, uh, to consider in a very mindful way in their career. Now, how do you, what does this actually look like in terms of deliverables for the class? Well, the class is all built around an individual project that you design and pursue, where I ask you, leading up to the class in the fall, to consider a communication challenge that you are interested in that you aim to create a creative solution to through the course of the class. And we have a very specific definition for creativity in our class because we also, as a graduate program, believe that words like leadership, words like creativity, they get bandied around a lot. And so we think it's important being a communication graduate program that we define them very explicitly. And so in the way that I've talked about leadership at all levels, the creativity definition we use in my class is something that is both novel and useful. That is our definition of creativity. And so each of the students is asked to not only identify a communication challenge of their own choosing, but to then work both through independent research, but also deeply collaborative exercises in class to quote unquote solve that communication challenge in a creative fashion. And just as some varied examples over the four years that I've been teaching the class, we've done, we've, we've looked at everything oh, uh, from how to raise awareness around landmines in Southeast Asia to looking at the way that we understand uh, purchase consumer psychology and what would it take to to create different interfaces on different uh, different kinds of, um, uh, when you're online and actually looking at consumer behavior, what are some different prompts that could happen that would allow you to be more mindful about your purchases, to looking at a geolocation app for understanding the indigenous history of Tacoma in a way that's very experiential, very immersive. So you can see that's a real range of programs, a, very, a real range of projects, and it's very much intended to allow individuals in the class to pursue a topic that is deeply interesting to them because we believe very strongly that part of the joy of graduate school is that you get to pursue ideas that are meaningful to you and gird them in a very strong intellectual way. I mean, you are here on this campus for a reason and our job is to create a curriculum that allows you to challenge yourself academically but to always do it in service of your professional goals. And so we see this class as not only culturating you to graduate school, but also, as I said, building that critical thinking muscle, building that creative problem solving muscle, doing it in the context of a larger core class where you get to get to, you get to know each other, but also then providing you an independent project that becomes, in many cases, the, the very beginnings of your online portfolio that we feel strongly is, is a, a piece of collateral that's important for all of you as, you as you move through the program is to be able to say, here are projects that I've worked on, that I've created, that are original to me. Um, some are done independently, like in my class, some will be done in groups. But this class really aims at helping you understand leadership, personal narrative, but then also very much uh, how you approach a communication challenge and apply a creative lens to solving it. So after that fall core class, you have an open field for your electives in winter, but then in spring, we turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Kenya Sheen, who teaches our second core class, I'll let her now talk about that. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, so uh, our classes are actually built on each other and Anita's class that's being taught right now is a fantastic way for all the class members to find out about their passions and also identify a challenge that they want to solve themselves. Come spring, that fun is over. <laughs> it's all exams, it's all memorization. It's, it's terrible, no, I'm joking. It's actually uh, a moment where we redefine and think about communication challenge in a broader way, uh, we start working with organizations and tackle with their existing communication challenges at that moment. So it's a class that particularly thinks about organizational storytelling and the ways in which organizations define themselves uh, in the very particular landscapes uh, that they find themselves in and the challenges that they face as they try to do so. So to give you a sense of it, last spring we had three clients in the class uh, people were assigned to different groups. 
Each client had a different challenge. I'll give you two examples. One of our clients was we, Wagner Edstrom, uh, which is the PR company for Microsoft. Uh, because they're the PR company for Microsoft, everyone knows them as the PR company for Microsoft. So the challenge that they came to our class with was trying to understand how to redefine themselves as they tackle with new clients, as they tackle with new communication strategies. So we helped them define um, that and how to uh, engage with that. And actually, we were there uh, last uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we had an event at WE. Um, and uh, there, they talked to us about how they implemented some of our class's strategies to their incoming engagements. Uh, they actually wrote a, a kind of a backstory, a history of, our, of their organization, which was a suggestion of one of the students in our class. Um, so uh, that was one client. Another client uh, was Fair Start. Uh, does anyone know Fair Start here? Fair Start is a, a fantastic organization that tries to re that tries to educate uh, uh, different communities that struggle with uh, poverty and homelessness, uh, and uh, they train them in culinary arts. Not only that, but they have fantastic restaurants and cafes all around the city as well. Uh, but because they're in a particular organization that uh, directly deal with those who are in a moment of struggle, they have a very hard time communicating with their alumni and creating a broader community engagement after people finish their program or after they finish working uh, for the organization. So our class uh, started a, a kind of thinking about different outreach strategies for this organization. We worked alongside with them. Uh, we offered the students presented at the last class as they did with all three clients. Um, and uh, some of our uh, students are still working on uh, with uh, Fair Start right now, trying to implement the kind of suggestions, broad suggestions our uh, spring class has came up with. Uh, today, there are so many organizations that are trying to understand who they are. Uh, a lot of key organizations in the region, but beyond, all around the world, want to tell stories about who they, who they themselves are, but they're in an environment that constantly changes, so we tackle with that in the uh, spring class. Now, um, now that we gave you a very quick and fast overview of the two um, different core classes that everyone has to take, so if you choose to come to communication leadership, you'll definitely see Anita and me, for sure. But you're going to also see a number of really exciting faculty that I work alongside with and Anita works alongside with as we build our curriculum every year in response to our partnerships with key organizations uh, in the um, in the region. Um, so we have actually a very exciting team, Lola, Lola. There are many scholars doing research in the types of professional communication world that we're talking about. Uh, for example, uh, Benjamin Mayfield uh, is a prolific scholar of a structure like Wikipedia, and he teaches a class about community and collaboration. So his research and his discussion is one of the uh, key discussions in that landscape. But in addition to that, we have a number of uh, faculty that work in key organizations in Seattle and beyond. So you would be taking classes with our faculty that work in organizations like OWL, as uh, Dave Holmberg does. Kelly Myers works, uh, she teaches analytics and marketing for us, and uh, she works for Disney. Um, and then I'm just looking at uh, the list over there, uh, and faculty uh, like David Evans is uh, part of Microsoft Research. Uh, so your faculty actually is also a way for you to network with the professional community. Uh, a new faculty in the winter quarter will be, for instance, Ian Maguire, who's a content strategist for Facebook. So you not only uh, do discuss the topics with the key people who are trying to define and engage and write about these subject matters, but you're going to also have faculty that are directly working in organizations that might be the types of organizations that you want to work with. So you'll have tangible question, uh, connections through your portfolio and your in-person contacts. Um, finally, uh, in a lot of these classes, through uh, a lot of our faculty, uh, you'll also be, like the spring core class, you'll be doing a lot of client-based projects as well. Uh, Molly will talk about our partnerships, but beyond our partnerships, uh, most of our classes actually work alongside organizations too. Uh, so a lot of your, uh, what we would call homework, but not really, is actually work uh, for existing organizations. So throughout the uh, program, you'll be building your portfolio and you'll be able to mention these projects as you uh, hunt for jobs after the very fun experience at communication leadership. Now, um, I wanna turn it over to uh, my colleague, Molly, 
uh, who's going to tell you a little bit about the beyond the class experiences that will enhance your both uh, personal experiences and professional portfolios. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I am Molly, I'm the head of partnerships for Calm Lead. And with my colleague Alex, who just had to step out, he and I work together to lead a lot of the beyond the classroom experiences. So something that you join when you join Calm Lead is a really connected, engaged learning community. And I often like to say we are an MBA for communications professionals. And so the connotation with an MBA is that you join this really strong network. I think our network's even better. Um, so I would argue that the, the networking experiences in the community you join is as important as the curriculum. So some of the ways that we engage our community is through working with partner organizations. And Hanson and Akin alluded to that a little bit. Um, we do that through things like monthly networking events. So each Friday, the first Friday of every month, we go to a different organization around town, and these range from pet companies to big companies like Amazon to nonprofit, so all across the board. They invite us and host our community for um, an networking reception and tell us a little bit about some behind the scenes aspect of working in an organization. Um, some other ways that we collaborate with organizations, I can mention this, a lot of our classes work with clients in the class. So a lot of your project will actually be delivering hard deliverables to an organization who's come to us because they know that they can get expert communication strategies from our students. Um, and we also, in addition to our faculty, who you saw before, um, there are practitioners working in a lot of these organizations who you might want to be connected to. They also bring in guest speakers from other organizations. So within the classroom, you're being really connected as well. Um, and then another area that we, where we collaborate with organizations is through something called our partner program, very creative name, I know, partner <laughs> program. Um, and this is a way for students to put into practice some of the skills that you build, new skills that you're building in the classes with community organizations. So what this looks like is you'll work in a team from one to three students um, and kind of act as consultants on a specific project or deliverable for a, an organization, a nonprofit organization. And, um, with these collaborations, there's really five benefits that you get out of doing these. The first is you're putting your new skills into practice and building your portfolio. The second is you're receiving scholarship money. So we have some donors that love to support our program and, and get our students out of the community exercising what they're learning in the class. The third is that you gain experience working with clients. As anyone in the creative profession knows, clients can be interesting to work with sometimes. So this allows you to kind of build those relationship skills. Um, the fourth is that you're going to be supporting local nonprofits and causes, so it's a way to give back to the community. And then the fifth is to, again, grow your professional network. So, like I said, um, these are just a sample of some of the organizations who we work with. Very well-connected community. All of us are here to support students and, and kind of connect them when you're ready to pivot in your career or take that next step. Um, and again, it's kind of as important as a curriculum and, and the great experience that you get out of being part of the community. I think that's it on the partner side. And next, I think Heather. I think we're going to show the video first. Sure. We're going to show you a video. First. Do you want, do you want, do you want to tee it up, Molly? Or do you, uh, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so we are going to show you a video that was created by two of our current students. Um, they're uh, professional filmmakers who came to the program. And they are working on an independent study that's telling um, their experience of being students in the program. And the full video, we're not going to show you today. It's a very artistic video that will be ready soon, so we can follow up and share it with you then. But the video you're going to see today is an excerpt of that, and they highlight a couple student experiences. So we thought we might as well hear about the program from a student. <coughs> Hi there. I'm Scott Morris, a Com Lead student from Cohort 15. And three years ago, almost to the day, I was sitting right where you are right now, at an info session for the program, wondering, is grad school the right move for me? At that event, I met this guy, Jacob Christensen, another prospective student. A few months later, we decided to start a video storytelling company. In the past two plus years, we've made a viral video, a national commercial. We were even nominated for an Emmy. Now, if you join this program, will you have a similar experience? I don't know. You might have a better one. But I do know you'll be joining an incredible community where you'll work on things that will feed your mind as much as your heart, where you'll be asked to push yourself beyond what you think you're capable of, and where you'll be amazed by what you produce. Because that's what happens in ComLead. Not just with me or Jacob or a handful of students, but just about all of us. And so I wanna share a snippet of a larger project I'm working on right now with another ComLead student, Scott Wilson. 
featuring three other Comlead students as well. Rosa, Mei Ling, and Danny. With every class that I've taken, each experience has given me something that I could add to a portfolio. Employers are looking for something that you've done and that you can bring to their organization. I feel like the program has given me a level of confidence that I don't think I could have found anywhere else. International students always face a lot of struggles and challenges. At first, I wasn't very comfortable asking people to introduce me to their connections. But we have a strong sense of community here. What would the ideal experience be like if I went to work and felt passionate about that? That's essentially what led me to pursue Comlead. Now, the work that I am doing, it's, it's a really phenomenal reason to wake up in the morning. Director of Academic Services for the graduate programs in the department. Um, and that means I'm the person that will help you through the application process and answer all your questions about that and then um, help you through the program itself in terms of meeting all your degree requirements. And so, so, <coughs> so first thing is that we're first, we're first, we're first, so you guys are great, great, early, you work on that application. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons, and that you truly have plenty of time and you don't require the GR. So no studying for a test and no scheduling that, no paying the $200 for that. Um, but there are some things that you should be aware of um, in terms of prerequisites. You have to have the equivalent of a bachelor's degree um, to apply any major. We don't care what your background is. We've had students from engineering, music, French, and other languages, business, communication, um, so really whatever your background is, is fine as long as you have that bachelor's degree with at least a 3.0 um, or B average in your last two years. So that's the graduate school's rule, and the nice thing about that is it cuts out those freshman classes where you have like physics at 8 a.m. and maybe you didn't do so well in that, and um, you don't care. It's just those last two years, so it's usually just your major classes um, that are being looked at. Uh, and then the other requirement is that um, you meet English language proficiency. So like a bachelor's degree from the United States meets that, um, or there are other ways to meet that requirement that are linked in this memo eight um, on the how to apply page if you're not a native English speaker. As far as the application itself and the materials, we have it pretty basic. We want your unofficial transcripts of previous college experience, and you only need to provide Transcripts from schools where you earned a bachelor's degree or higher. We don't need community college transcripts, we don't need high school, we don't need study abroad programs that you did. So just anywhere where you earned a bachelor's degree or higher, or will earn if you're currently in your senior year. You also need the names and emails of free references. So it's an online recommendation system. Um, so once you enter your recommenders and their name and their email address, they immediately get an email. So make sure you've already talked with them before you enter them um, in there. And um, that's an automated email that goes out right away. Um, and then they get a link to fill out your recommendation um, entirely online. We also want your current resume. Um, and part of the reason we recommend not submitting an application until close to the deadline is so that resume really is as current as possible. You know, a lot of our prospective students are changing jobs, and then seeking a new position in December or January. I and mean, once you've submitted an application, it's locked. Like you can't change anything about it. Um, so it's really wait until after January 1st to show that resume is as up to date as possible. And then the most important part of the application is your personal statement. And we have right here on the website um, the prompt for that, for your written personal statement. In 500 words or fewer, we mean that. You write more than that, Anita will stop reading. <laughs> and so if it doesn't make sense because she stopped in the middle of the thought, too bad. <laughs> so 500 words or fewer, um, we want you to explain how either the MCDM or MCDM, whichever the degree you're applying to, will specifically help you advance towards your professional goals and why you're a good match for the program. So why us, why now? Um, you know, why are you applying to this degree? What will it do for you? 
And um, what do you think you're going to contribute and to the program and the community? If you've stressed a lot, we are you know, quite a connected learning community. And how, how are you going to be a part of that in the program? And um, you're right, your personal statement also serves as your writing sample. So make sure you get a lot of different people to look at it, proofread it. Typos stand out very severely in 500 words. So <laughs> get some help in, in, in proofing that as well. And then we have kind of a unique requirement, which is a video. So we ask you to complete, um, to create a 90 second video. Now for those of you with no video background, don't start panicking. Think of this as um, you're answering an interview via Skype. This is one interview question. Um, so we just want straight, like hold your phone up, open your laptop, your webcam, no editing, no graphics, nothing like that. Just a straight shot as if you were on a Skype interview with someone. Um, and in that 90 seconds, um, when you're answering that question, we want you to tell us one story from your life that illustrates your desire to join our program. So that's pretty open and that's on purpose so that you can choose what story you want to tell. Um, we do just remind you that make it something different than what's already reflected in your personal statement or in your, your resume. We're going to have those materials so you don't need to repeat anything that's in there. You know, give us a, a glimpse into who you are. Um, this is a chance for us to get to know you off paper um, during the application process. Um, and then like for non-native English speakers, um, UW only accepts the TOEFL now, and I've gotten a lot of questions about that. The IELTS is another English proficiency test that UW no longer accepts. So if you need to submit a test um, to meet that English proficiency requirement, it has to be the TOEFL. It's the only one that they'll accept now. But that's just a brief overview of the application elements. And then just to give you an idea of the timeline for this, we have that at the bottom of this page as well. So October 1st, applications are open. So you can start your application anytime. And you can go back in and you can save and come back to your application later, update it. So don't hesitate to go ahead and start an application um, at any point. And then we asked, you know, after January 1st, you can begin submitting applications so that they're as current as possible. And our application deadline is February 1st by midnight Seattle time. Um, and so the minute by then, um, we are very fast about reviewing those applications you know, meeting as, a, as an admissions committee, making decisions. So usually we will let you know by mid-March. Last year, I think it was March 5th, and so it was actually early in March. Sometimes it depends on when South by Southwest is happening because <laughs> some of our faculty go to that. Um, but by mid-March, you will know. And then we ask you to let us know if you're accepting our offer by April 15th um, so that we can finalize our cohort and start planning for the fall. And with that, um, I think we're going to move to having our students and alumni who are here introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll start our Q&A. Students, come on. So I'm back because I'm also a student in the program. So um, there's that. I'm in, my name's Molly, you already heard from me already. Um, I'm in the Master of Communication and Communities and Networks degree. I started this fall. Um, I wasn't planning to speak today, but we have another student who is going to pop over when she's on a break from class. Her name's Rosa. Um, so for those of you in the room, you'll see her come in around 7.30 if you're still here. Um, but she has class tonight because our classes are in the evening. So there's dinner break, you she'll still come over. Um, but I just want to let you know that I am also a current student, so when it is time for questions, and if you have any you know, questions about that, or those of you um, watching from afar, um, I'm happy to answer questions with my student hat on as well as the head of partnership hat on. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it to some of my peers now. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Angie, and last year I was sitting where you were, uh, sitting there thinking, can I even be accepted in this program? Uh, is this something I want to do? I have been looking at STEM degrees uh, previous to this, and of course that's kind of a completely different direction. I realized that, but I've been a math major in the past, so it just seems like it's good. Uh, of course, I had kind of an aha moment once I went to the website and started reading the course description. That was genuinely what really sold me on the program. Uh, nothing previous to that could really sparked my interest enough to write that $30,000 check. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, after starting the program in eight weeks or so, I think I've been to probably a half dozen events mm -hmm. and really been wowed by everything that Molly and the children have put together. I mean, the coursework has been pretty incredible as well. It's 
been challenging, but yet definitely something that's doable. I'm working full time uh, and I do take the program half time. So <clears throat> it's uh, it fills up my time, but it's also not so overwhelming that I can't just approach it every week with kind of a fresh thought and stay creative and doing the work that we're doing. Uh, let's see, what else did I do? Oh, this is kind of an anecdote, I suppose. I filmed my video in my yoga studio because it made me feel comfortable. I really don't like doing videos. <laughs> so, Tasha, I believe, has uh, more to add. Hi, I'm Teresa. And uh, thanks for having you guys. And uh, I would like to share my experience and uh, what I think from this program. I'm Tokar 17, so this means uh, it's my first quarter here. And, uh, I think I've been two things on this program so far. Uh, the first thing is storytelling skills. And I think storytelling is the foundation of everything. And whether you want to be a PR or you want to work at the healthcare area or even you want to find a job in the high technology <coughs> companies. And also to build your own networks. And we have the first Friday events. Uh, it means that every month um, we go to the different organizations and uh, we can see what they are uh, doing there and uh, we can see if there are any open positions. And also we have classmates from different backgrounds and uh, they are from um, film industry, they are musicians and uh, they are from house care areas and uh, it's always a pleasure to expand your social circle. Mm -hmm. And also, it's good to know people from the industry. We have many guest, speak, guest speakers uh, in class. And I think it's real, really helpful that you can know a bigger picture from to the industry. So Angie and Kesa are here for when you start to ask questions, feel free to direct them at the current students if your question might be more um, resonated with them. And then the one last thing, thank you guys so much, um, is I forgot to mention, is the alumni fellows. So we have an alumni volunteer group, another way to extend your network, I forgot to mention this earlier. Um, so we have a number of alumni fellows who are here to support students, they host workshops, they mentor students, they further make your connections. This is on our website as well, so you can read their bios and see that they're, again, from a number of different industries across the board. So I think with that, are we going to move to Q&A? Yeah. And to uh, incentivize you to ask really great questions, and unfortunately those who are live streaming can't do this, we actually have, uh, I mentioned the hit makers book. Anybody who asks a question, you get a free book. So we have some books that are going to give away for being here. So, so we encourage questions. We love to be challenged by students and prospective students. So please go ahead and ask us any question you have, whether it's about what it means to get into the program, what it's like on a daily basis being a student in the program, um, whatever else. So go ahead. Now I'm repeating your question is still the live stream to pick it up. And uh, I won't be necessarily answering all of them. Hi. Hello. Uh, I know Angie just mentioned it, but curious if uh, she or, or you can get a little more granular with what the program kind of looks like working full time. What does the program look like working full time? Same, 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 same. Um, first of all, um, all of our, for the most part, most of our classes are five credits, which means on a weekly basis, the expectation is around 10 hours, 15 hours, a week. that includes class time plus preparation. And so if you're talking about 10 weeks in a quarter. And 15 weeks, 15 hours per class of work and class time. So uh, we encourage people who are working full time to only take one class a quarter. Some take two, but that's that's a real heavy load. It's essentially like having two jobs. Um, and then so you're you're using your time that you're not in on the job actually just preparing for class and being in class. And all of our classes are either on the weekends or in the evenings from six to ten. Angie, do you want to say anything else to the how you manage to balance your work life with your professional students? Yeah, so the core class is the first class that you would take, and it's every other Saturday. So I've really been able to focus all of my I'm Monday through Friday work life, and then the off weekend, I've been able to really accomplish a lot in terms of getting all my work done and being prepared for that class going in. And then maybe I spend a few hours, a couple 
mentally how you're doing. Well, <laughs> oh yeah, we're also going to be listening. To, we have live stream questions for everybody right now. You want to tell them that uh, they can use the chat oh, function yeah. to ask questions. Of you yeah. are on live stream, you can use the chat function on live stream to send us questions and we'll answer them. I will not send you folks by here. Here we go. Question there. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about how how you got us through making the decision between uh, the MCBM and the MCPM program. You know, what sort of what types of people will go to each program, and you know, what, what, uh, how how we sort that out. It's a DNA test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I mean, and it's usually um, you know you could go through the. I think one way to do it is actually is to go through the website on the curriculum page. And look at the classes under each of those degree emphases and see which one actually resonates with you. And if you, you might actually find that you self select based on the kind of classes that you want to take. Um, other than that, um, you should start asking yourself some other questions in terms of do you want to learn more around production skills? Do you want to learn how to create and deploy content? Are you more interested in actually creating and thinking about those stories? Or are you more interested in um, sort of more strategic in terms of making the connections and communication? And the MCCN has storytelling in it, but it doesn't necessarily always require technology to facilitate that storytelling. In a more traditional world, the MCCN might have been uh, a PR or a communications degree, and the MCBM might be more on the sort of production documentary storytelling. Not this is not a traditional world anymore, and so those that doesn't apply. But you can sort of think about the application of skills and technology are different in each of those and what you might learn. Does anybody else want to do a better job of saying that? No, well, that's a great answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, a lot of students ask why, what, what percentage is that? Percentage gets in. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, sorry, the question was what's the percentage in terms of the number of students who get in? It varies every year and we don't. It's almost an inconsequential thing because what we're trying to, we take the, the because we are connected in the community, we actually take the composition of each cohort very seriously. And so what we don't want is all of a sudden we have 80 people who are really great video editors, for example, or 30 people who have done amazing advocacy work and behave for half a nonprofit. We're really trying to really, we're composing a group of people who are going to get along really well we're going to support each other and we're actually going to learn from each other because we raise certain level of skills or experiences that are really relevant. And so we, you know, the cohort size has fluctuated over the last few years from, from 45 to this year's 86. And it really based on, it's almost like who is qualified enough to be part of this? And we will make a decision based on that. So we don't necessarily have a quota or a limit. It's more about who we really want to be in the program. And how we bring them in. So, and you've heard when we were talking about what we used to apply, um, we don't need a GRE. We will definitely look at your grades and the degrees you had before. But fundamentally, we want to see how, how did your objectives, your experiences, your skills align with what we actually have to offer in the program. And, and once those two, if it's, if it's a really good match there in terms of your attitude and, and that what you bring to the table with what we have to offer, it actually works out fairly well. Um, because it's a real it's a real growth experience being graduate school generally in our program it's a lot of growth because of the nature of the subject matter and how, how our students interact with each other so i actually did not answer your question because i want to point out just as much as there are no grades and hymns and any of these classes that that doesn't really matter what matters is who you are and how you fit with the grand student okay all right you get a free book hi yeah, you know, just to relieve the stress. I see, how, can I see hands again? So I will come to absolutely everyone. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you do? No, come back down, yeah, then I'll make the group. Uh, the group and everyone will get a book. Everyone gets a book. <laughs> 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 we we talked to Oprah, but she would give a talk. <laughs> 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 yeah. So um, you mentioned that you have a program for the seven rounds. Um, what are you curious, do you, how long have you, have you been with the program since it's, the program started in two that early two thousand two. Mm -hmm. I became director in two thousand seven. Okay. okay. Um, does that does that cause a problem? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's the lead into my question, which yeah. is, um, you know, with the interest being in such a progressive city, and and it seems like this program. I guess I want to get something wrong. It seems like this program is awesome because it's it's a 
consists of, of community. We, we already have this amazing community that's so, you know, tech heavy and there's so many amazing organizations here. Do you think that it's evolved a lot with Amazon, with Facebook, and have you seen that this program has changed a lot over the years? So the question is whether the program has changed a lot over the years, and the answer is absolutely. So um, when I came in in 2007, I, I brought the emphasis on storytelling because uh, my background as a journalist and a documentary filmmaker and somebody who started to dabble in social media before it was, it was anything. Um, but even then, in those first couple of years, 2007 to say 2010, it very much was Wild West. What is social media? Does it mean anything? Is anybody ever going to use it? You know, what does it mean to create a video? But always at the heart of it was we were saying that um, that the, the, the sort of monopoly on storytelling and putting media out, that, out there that belonged to a small number of gatekeepers like professional news organizations or broadcasters was now being made available to everybody. And so what we were advocating from that point was that every organization should consider itself a media organization and they have to actually reorient their thinking about what they use to engage people because the, the, the communication landscape is changing. And so over the, over the 10 years that I've been director, you know, we started very much on thinking about how those platforms are going to change thinking around communication. Um, and it began, and, it, and every year, because things were moving so fast, we would change classes. And we still uh, update our classes every six months, unlike traditional graduate programs. Uh, around 2012, 2013, when you had the Arab Spring, which I think was the high point of thinking positively about communication technologies, and then, you know, being the Donald Trump last year, um, there's been a really interesting continuum. In 2013, we added the second degree in communities and networks, and that allowed us to think that we weren't we weren't going to let the technology be the tail that wagged the dog. That fundamentally, it was about human relationship, human connection, what it meant to affect change in connecting meaningfully to other people. And so we we reoriented around that idea of communication as opposed to digital media. So we went. Content is still important. Storytelling is still important, obviously. Um, but we really think about what is the thing that we're trying to uh, convey and connect first and foremost, where technology may play a role or not. And so, yeah, I mean, we're in a very tech-heavy city um, that's really prosperous and has made a lot of money and brought a lot of people here because of that. Um, but in many ways, we are the alternative voice. Even as we have great relationships with all those companies, we're also saying, well, let's not go so fast and sort of saying, let's go in after that. Well, let's think about what your Facebook strategy is. First and foremost, how are you trying to serve your community? You know, what, do you, what leadership do you want to affect? And then you can start thinking about it. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm on the Chamber of Commerce board as well, is that you get too wrapped up in the prosperity of the technology companies and the jobs they bring, and not thinking enough about the human impact of that. And that's what we're doing with the nearest program as well in the ocean. So that's a very long answer to say, yes, there's been a huge amount of evolution. And I believe that one of the reasons why we've been so successful, especially in the last couple of years, is because we have not been so focused on the technology, but we've been thinking much more about storytelling and change. Okay, I said we're gonna to go to a question there, and then uh, I'll come over here, and then I'll come to Heather if yeah. there's any online questions. Yeah. I want to take back on an earlier question to Angie. Um, as somebody who works full-time and does the program, how do you find that you're able to take full advantage of the networking opportunities and the time kind of outside the classroom, or is it just too much? <laughs> Angie, can you repeat the question as well? Yeah. Uh, how do I find the time to to doing the program 
full time versus part time, and some people don't have a choice. So I work full time and um, do the program part time. I think you the work more than full time. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and I think the so the program full time on the one hand, all you're doing is school, so you're focusing on that. Um, however, you go through the program quicker than if you do it part time. So because it is kind of go at your pace. So when you're weighing pros and cons, if you're doing it part time, you could argue that you could even get more out of it because you have more events to go to because you're a student for longer. So that's the one thing to know that. I mean, the, the events thing is really, I mean, it's not mandatory, obviously. It's an embarrassment of riches because there are so many organizations that want to engage with you as students because they want to hire you or they want you to be aware of what value they bring to the community so you might use their services. So um, it's, there's, you know, there's no obligation to go to these things, but it's, it's wonderful because we always understood that because we are a graduate program for professionals and the classes are in the evenings and the weekends, that we have to think about building community in a different way because students don't spend the entire day with each other and hang out in the dorms after, which is what some of you might have had in undergraduate. And so it's really an opportunity for us to build those cohesive bonds of, of connection amongst ourselves to have those opportunities. And we make enough of them available to you that you only have to hang out with them. So I think we're going to take one question from online. I think there was, and I'm going to start moving on the side of the room. Heather. <laughs> And I think I'll end up answering this question as well. So this is task and answer. Um, the online question was asking, what's the level of professional experience um, for most students prior to joining the program? Um, and this year, our cohort 17, uh, which has mentioned 86 students, about 40, just over 40 of those, like 42 or 43, had earned their bachelor's degree within the last um, two years. And so we're pretty much fresh out of undergrad um, without a lot of professional experience. We get other students that have decades of industry experience who are coming back. We've had, you know, our white-haired students uh, returning to school and earn their master's degree, and then everywhere in between. Um, and so I think most of the students that aren't fresh out of undergrad tend to have five or so years of work experience um, in the industry. And a lot of those students have figured out through being on the job what they don't know. Um, so now they know what they don't know. And they want to come to school and learn that and enhance their skills. Um, and so we see that a lot with people saying, you know, I've been doing this work and um, now I want to learn why some things I'm doing work and why some things don't work because I don't know the theory behind it. I don't know the strategies. I've just been kind of winging it because my company said, hey, do social media because you're a millennial. And we hear that <laughs> and I do it a lot. It was like, you just do this. And so we don't require any particular amount of professional experience. Um, you can be coming fresh out of undergrad, never even had an internship, that's fine. Um, or you can be coming to us and know some of these topic areas so well, you could probably teach the class. And we just advise that you probably don't take those classes, you know, take the things that you don't know. I just wanted to make sure I got, was there one more question on this side before I make you order that? Okay, so you, your hand is so high up in the air, we gotta make sure that you're So since the MCCA is a fairly new program, I guess it started in 2013. So uh, how do you think, uh, so, uh, uh, is there enough demand for NCCM graduates in particular uh, in the industry as compared to the MCDM graduates? Well, so the question was whether, because MCCM is a newer degree, we started in 2013, whether there's uh, as much demand for an MCCM graduate as an MCDM graduate. The answer is um, that, first of all, when you get a degree from our program, it doesn't say, it says Master of Communication in it. It doesn't say Master of Communication in Digital Media, it say Communication Leadership. And so it is fundamentally up to you. You get to own the degree you get from this program. How you put it on your resume and how you talk to your employer is up to you. You can say, I have a master's from the University of Washington in communities and networks because the job is, say, a community manager job or it's a communication uh, executive job and that you understand how to actually leverage and create human sort of um, momentum around a brand or something like that. Uh, and so it's up to you to actually exercise some of your skills as a graduate of our program to make that sale. In terms of recognition of uh, one degree over another, um, I mean, the words themselves may mean something to people, but we brand ourselves as communication leadership and communication leadership by the University of Washington. And that's what employers, especially in this region, recognize. And so you might want to see those degree names more as emphases uh, about what you have focused on while you were in the program, as opposed to the equivalent of saying, what is it? an MBA such a recognized three letter acronym People will just hire me as an MBA. So I, it's a very, again, another nuanced answer to your question. Um, I firmly believe at a, at a higher level that the Master of Communication Communities and Networks is where it's going to be at uh, in terms of where everything is going. 
the technology that supported all the change you've seen over the last few years is going to get both bigger and more invisible to the point where people aren't going to be thinking about what it takes to use that technology to communicate anymore. They're going to be thinking about what it takes to really get people to connect to each other in a meaningful way because the technological side, we won't be thinking about it anymore. Just like we don't think about refrigerators anymore. That was a huge innovation in the 1930s. And so I like to call the communities and networks degree the degree of the future. And the students who tend to take it, um, it's just, we keep it smaller, by the way, so there's less, less students in it so we can make sure that we offer the right classes. They tend to be a little more advanced or they truly understand where the world is going and how they can leverage the degree. Okay, I'm still staying on this side of the room. Yes. So you mentioned a lot of, or this paper has a lot of partnered organizations and things like that. Do you guys do work with any like public school organizations? Digital storytelling is such like a hot topic right now coming from, I'm an English teacher, I've taught English for five years, and it's one of those things that I did and had to kind of just like pull out information and be like, oh, this is a new thing that I should do. So do you guys do things with schools or like, is that just, I don't know. So the question is whether we do any collaborations or work with public schools or schools generally. So we're talking K-12, kindergarten, grade 12. Um, I'll say a few things to that. First of all, because Molly's the head of partnerships, we're really open to collaborating with various entities and organizations that may be interested in leveraging our expertise. Secondly, over the last few years, we have had a formal relationship with uh, Washington STEM, which is an organization that champions uh, science, technology, engineering, and math education in K-12. And actually, a couple of our students, uh, Danny Gross, you saw in the video, actually works at Washington STEM. Um, thirdly, one of our faculty and my our former colleagues, Associate Director Scott Macklin, has driven the um, focus in Seattle Public Schools around create the creative economy and how to teach some of our skills. So uh, the answer is, in a, in, a, in a small way, yes, and there's actually more ways to do it. Uh, we also have great relationships with, non with startups that are thinking differently about how to deploy technology and learning technology in K-12. I've been to South by Southwest Education a few times. And so as Anita has actually presented at it. So we see a really deep connection with uh, K-12 schools in terms of the technologies and the approaches. And if this, this is where the opportunity lies for all of you, that if you have something that really matters to you, um, you actually get to exercise that passion in the program. We once had a student who's one of my favorite graduates. His great-great-granduncle was Lead Belly, the very famous blues artist. And his family owns all, their, all of that guy's songs. He's like, I wanted to build a digital library out of that. So he spent a lot of his time choosing classes that would allow him to support that passion that he could build that business. So if public education is your passion, you can definitely make it happen. Um, I, I, I favor that side so much, I just want to see if there are any questions here, unless I go back to Heather on the, on the computer. Yes? When you're talking uh, about the students actually face to make stand out in the industry in your experience of interacting with the alumni from what does the degree, what makes the degree stand out? In no, the people who take in this program and how do they induct you, what exactly are kind of like the key core features or like something that sets them apart from the crowd? That's a good question. So what's, what sets kind of graduates apart when it comes to getting jobs in, in, in the industry? Um, first of all, I think especially in this part of the world along the West Coast, there's been a recognition that, yes, this is a very technology-centered world that we live in, uh, but it's been very much uh, created in, and, and formed around the engineers, the, the people who are very technical in their thinking. But there's also a recognition that these same technologies have facilitated a need for people to have a say or have a relationship with the same companies and technologies um, that they're deploying. And what, what these people have recognized is that they don't have the ability to do that. It's a, fund a fundamental lack of social skills and communication. And so a lot of people who come to us are the scientists and the engineers and the technicians who recognize that they don't know how to make sense of the thing that they've created. And they want our students and our graduates to play that role. And it's a role that's both external and internal. These people are agents of transformation and translation, They're both internal communication and external communication. So when Amazon comes and starts recruiting our students, yeah, there's some very obvious places that Amazon will want to put our students, whether it's an Amazon Fresh in terms of marketing, or um, one of our more famous students is the chief evangelist for a huge creative the blog for Amazon Web Services. Um, but it's also people who they know they, they can put in the middle of a group of engineers who are involved in product development and say, hey, can you actually connect the dots for us as this technology is emerging? 
make sense of it so these guys don't get too caught up in just the functionality, not think about how people are actually going to use it. And that's the user experience and user design. And so the recognition, I think, in the outside world of what we do is the fact that we are focused on making sense of things and, and making sense in, in a way that people think and do differently because of that. It's not enough just now to get attention anymore. It really is how do people engage and how do you actually affect change? And change isn't just about making your world better. It's about getting people to vote differently. It's about getting people to buy something differently, whatever else. Can I add, um, also just to give an example of your, of your question, uh, we were at Seattle Interactive Conference a, a couple of months ago. Uh, it's a big conference, all the companies are there. Um, one of the things that I always realize whenever we have our students with us, we led a, a meetup session there where we talked about oceans and ocean storytelling, uh, sponsored also by B. Uh, but there, uh, one of the things that was always inspiring for me, uh, working with the students, is our students actually get the type of skills that make them stand out in the set. So our students were leading conversations, their presentation skills, the way in which they approached employers, the way in which they talk and know about issues actually make them shine in these larger settings. So we're not only thinking about issues and teaching you skills, but we're making you actually prepared to have the types of conversations that leaders in the field are waiting to have with future employees. That's a, that's a good point. You saw three of our students on the stage. Nobody's, you know, they're not reading a script. These are people who know how to advocate for themselves, advocate for an idea, and advocate within their organizations. And that's really important. To us, that's communication leadership. And that's the battery. <laughs> See, thinking on your feet. Is this what <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Other, do we have any questions online, Heather? Um, we do. We have two people with the same question. Are there any graduate assistantships or other tuition aid opportunities available apart from scholarships offered by the partner program? Oh, they've got. So, is there, are there any uh, tuition support systems other than what's offered by the partner program? And we've been very aggressive on raising money for the partner program so that people can get tangible work experience and get paid for it. Do you want to answer that question? On <laughs> sure. <laughs> I knew it would make me that question. Passing the buck. Yeah, make it easy to that. Um, so, University of Washington has two different types of degrees. There's state-funded programs and then what are called fee-based programs. And communication leadership is a fee-based program. And what that means is that we don't get a dime from the state. Our only funds come from student tuition um, paid into the program. It's the, it's the only um, source of funding. Um, unfortunately, because of that, it means we cannot provide assistantships um, like a state-supported program can do, uh, like our PhD program, for example, which has that. Now, that said, we have occasionally had students in the program find assistantships in other departments, um, especially, I know, the, the language departments are constantly looking for people to teach their basic classes, so students that come in that know another language um, have been able to find um, those types of positions. Um, it's often programs that don't have a graduate degree, but only have an undergraduate degree that will have assistantships open to um, students from other departments because they don't have their own internal grad students kind of built in um, to provide that service. So short answer, no, um, but we also have been successful in um, finding students other types of funding. So we've had a couple of students um, and Rosa, I might talk about that, and she, if she gets here, I always saw questions going, was able to get a scholarship through um, GOMAP, which is um, a part of the graduate school, the Graduate Opportunity Minority Achievement Program. And so we've had two or three students get funding from them. Um, it's an external funding source. Um, and then we also have a lot of students who use employer reimbursement, and a lot of local employers provide some tuition reimbursement. Um, and so they've used that. We have a lot of veterans in the program who use GI Bill funding um, to help fund the degree. And then our degrees, while um, fee-based is a different category, it doesn't change your eligibility for student loans. So that's always an option um, that we're fully eligible for um, that kind of financial aid. So thank you for delivering the somewhat bad news. <laughs> it's worth mentioning that in my time as director, uh, we have really tried to keep the degree as affordable as possible. We look at our competition across the country. Uh, we are considerably less expensive. And it's part of, I think, our ethos is really to, even though we are self-sustaining, we don't want to. We're not trying to make money off the backs of our students. And so, uh, right now, tuition is about thirty. It's about thirty-two thousand, Heather, for the degree. Yes. Yeah. And you know, competing degrees are forty-five to sixty thousand dollars. And so we kept it low, and because we have, we try to keep our costs low as well, so that you can benefit as much as possible. And given that the, the job market, especially here, is so robust, we feel like it's a, a worthwhile investment. Yes. 
Yeah, for international students, um, it might be a little bit challenging. And for those people, international students who don't have um, marketing or communication background, um, how challenging that is, and, and how can they prepare ahead of time? You know, after even after they get you know. So the question was for international students. Obviously, I mean, it's a challenge, and, and for those who don't have a lot of marketing or communication background, how you prepare for it? And so. Um, a lot of our international students, especially those who come from countries in Asia, such as Taiwan and China and Hong Kong, tend to be um, the ones who come out with maybe one to two years out of undergrad or straight out of undergrad. And what we've noticed is that, uh, and the thing that we like about those particular students is that they've done a lot of relevant work while they were students, whether it was internships or class projects or something in their universities from an advocacy point of view that really speak to their ability to communicate. We, you know, even though we, we don't have prerequisites around degrees or skills, we're definitely looking for people who have an ability or an aptitude to communicate the way we think we should be communicated. And so we're not expecting, you know, we're obviously going to teach you to get, get to a certain level, but we're looking for demonstrable interest and focus and passion in actually playing in the same field that we do. So, um, we really recommend that you try to get internships, whether you're coming from those different countries. And we also recommend that you show that um, if you so that if you look at the class that we offer, that you actually have some kind of connection to some of that. I think it's worth asking you in terms of where you you know how you felt coming into the program and how prepared you felt and how you made your journey and transition. <laughs> And uh, it's, of course, challenging to be here. Uh, one thing is about language. And uh, the other thing is about uh, uh, we have to come with a communication challenge uh, for the core class. And um, I think either you are, uh, your background is communication related or you are work for other uh, industry, uh, you can come up with your own community communication challenge. I think you can always find your own way to go through this. I think you, if you are trying to, um, how do you say that? If you are trying to extend your reality bubbles, your, your reality circles, you come to the right place. And I think, um, of course, it's challenging, uh, especially to the international students. And uh, you will be fine if you are trying your best. That's <laughs> and one more thing is, uh, in addition to your traditional classes, uh, we have a number of workshops uh, that actually prepare you about how to create your portfolios, how to interview. So in addition to the class experiences, we have a number of free workshops led by our alumni or community who are leaders in the field. So if you feel like you're not super prepared in certain aspects of professional life, we supplement it not only in in-class experiences, but out-of-class experiences too. Uh, those are not mandatory, but you can pick and select and uh, grow your portfolio or your uh, different needs based on that as well. And I'll just add really quickly, um, there also the University of Washington also has a program that international students the first couple weeks before the quarter starts that you can join. Um, and then one of the first workshops that the alumni hold is an international student kickoff. So they invite all the international students, the alumni fellows group that we mentioned before always has at least one student who was an international student and now now gone on to be an alum. So again, that network is another way that you can help navigate and the complexities of marketing and communication and all that. We're, the bottom line is that we're highly welcoming to international students. Um, I was once an international student, so I know what it means to be coming from a different culture to try to adapt. Um, as you, you probably can't tell from the Kim's accent, but she's from Florida, so she's... Yeah. She, 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 <laughs> 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 she actually was from Florida, you know, she's Turkish. Um, and, and I will say that, uh, without sounding too Pollyannish, that some of the, the most creative work that I've seen in this program have come from students who, when they arrived, were international, who were so sort of shell-shocked by this very open American approach to graduate studies, but ended up see, recognizing within a few months that they'd been given permission to really explore the thing that mattered most to them. And some of the most creative work has come from those particular students. So it's a wonderful journey to be an international student. It's a harder one, but I think in the end it's actually quite and 25% of our students are international, so it's a big community. We love international students. Um, I see any, any other hands before I go back to Heather for an online question? Are you doing okay for any other online questions?
No, there was just someone mocking you by saying it would appear that the battery is actually why Hanson drops the mic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one just came in. My Instagram handle was a gray beard and a hoodie. One just came in after. Yes. <laughs> So the question about token scores, you said? Yeah, yeah that'll be uh, uh, Heather's, Heather around, around the token. Okay. What was the question? Uh, so the graduate school and the, the English proficiency requirement is a graduate school requirement. And so asking about like what total score is required, they require a 92 minimum to be eligible for admission without having to take other English classes, um, which is what we require because the way our program's set up, there just isn't time, um, it doesn't work out to, to add those other classes in as well. So you need at least a 92. Um, aside from that, we don't really um, pay strong attention to that. We look at your um, letter of uh, intent, you know, your personal statements, um, if that writing sample is, you know, how good is your writing um, at that level. We watch your video to see how, how good a communicator you are in telling your story. Um, but as long as you meet that minimum 92 on the TOEFL, um, then it, don't worry about trying to get like a couple extra points. <laughs> yes. Is there some sort of expectation around who the uh, reference of the recommenders are? Who the references or recommenders are? Is there an expectation around that? Um, we want somebody who's going to be able to speak to your. Uh, it'd be nice if the person knows you and can actually speak a little more personally about you. I don't think we're necessarily looking at. The credentials matter to a certain degree. Obviously, don't get your mom to write a reference. Um, a professor or somebody who understands how you actually do some of the work that you're interested in or you profess to be good at would be helpful. So, so I think somebody who basically has a uh, baseline knowledge of how you um, work professionally or what you might bring to the table. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Yeah. So you don't need to get I mean, some, some of our students got the like, president of Iceland or something like that. It's, 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 it's a too much. You want somebody who actually gets you, right? So it's, it can't be that hard. He was a great citizen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a student was a good citizen, right? Mike's pure. Yes. You kind of answered this. You don't get too much for this question. I don't, I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get it from the library anyway. But um, anyway. So um, I know that you mentioned that your graduates are, or your students are diverse. So yeah. if a person, I don't know, has worked in robotics or construction or whatever, but has this like passion, are you looking for? I would love that. Okay. So right. the question is about <laughs> diversity in terms of people coming from diverse backgrounds, both professional backgrounds. I love it. We have we, one of my favorite stories is about a student who she, he's a he's a, he's a surgeon. He's a medical surgeon. But he understands that to perform health today, you understand you need to understand what the technology is doing. You need to know how to advocate differently. And so, yeah, I love it when people come from those less traditional backgrounds. I want to apply what we call this world of communication first to that. And so, again, we're not looking for somebody who's got a background in marketing or communications or journalism. We're just looking for somebody who understands how important communication is in their world and can see what we have to offer and put one plus one together. And so we're looking for rigor, we're looking for discipline, we're looking for entrepreneurialism, we're looking for somebody who's not willing to, doesn't need to be spoon fed because there's an incredible lack of textbooks around a lot of the stuff that we teach. So people, that's what we're, we're weeding out when we're looking at those applications really. We, you have to be able to perform at a high level, you hold yourself to a high standard, but be prepared not to be able to get answers necessarily we all work to them in a very collaborative way in our classroom. I'll come back to you in a second. Oh, yes. I, I haven't heard from you before. But what are some of the students going on to do after? That is it's such a, it's an amazing <laughs> answer because it's just, it's everything and anything that they're particularly interested in. So I'll just, off the top of my head, I'll give you a couple of stories and examples. One that comes to mind immediately is that we had a student a few years ago who used to be a print journalist reporter in North Carolina. And so she moved to Seattle to take the program. Um, she ended up realizing that she didn't want to pursue journalism anymore because of the, the nature of the profession, the economics of the profession. She got a job at an agency, and then she got another job at an agency that specializes in nonprofits. And now she is Melinda Gates, um, her left hand, right hand woman, who handles Melinda Gates' digital. Uh, strategy. And so um, the 
idea is, is that, I mean, we do a, a lot of work and actually work on sort of advising our students in terms of passions, interests, and skills and aligning them with the kind of work that is out there. Um, other examples, we, I'm thinking about Gina, we had a woman from Canada who had an undergrad in linguistics who came to the program and um, she was very nerdy about words, uh, but she was also <laughs> trying to figure out how to apply that in communication. And we were able to connect her to some of our alum who work at Facebook and content strategy. And now she's the only content strategist who works entirely on linguistics for Facebook here in Seattle. So it really is um, you, it basically almost the sky's the limit in terms of what you get to do or what you want to do professionally. But what you have to do is figure it out uh, and, and consult with us in terms of what it is you want to do, what you think you're good at. And then we can start trying to look in our universe, and Molly does a lot of that for us, as you say, oh. Oh, this person might be good at, say, working at REI in content marketing because he or she is really interested in the outdoors and advocating on behalf of, you know, women and how they connect to nature. So, of course, the nature campaign at REI. Let's make sure that you can talk to the people that we have over there. So, um, those are just two or three examples. We have a, a lot of testimonials on our website, and we can also connect you to some of our students and alumni who have done that. Anything else come to mind, Molly, as, as a success story from the point of view that's really shy? On top of your head. I don't want to jump as well. No, yeah. Um, well, two that are different than that. And you mentioned the Washington STEM earlier. So the Danny Gross you saw in the video, he was working in a job at Microsoft and editing videos, was not inspired. And now he's leading communication strategy for Washington STEM, which is a, a education program we mentioned earlier. Um, and then another example would be Andrew Mittrap, another one of our alums. He is leading uh, communication and marketing for a virtual reality startup that's here in Seattle. So kind of on the other end of the spectrum. He previous now I think he's working at Russell Investments. I think doing communication and marketing for that. So kind of examples of a lot of career pivots and changes. And a lot of times people come to the program not really knowing what they want to do, and then through the classes and conversations with all of us, they help discover what that is. I really asked the right person. <laughs> <laughs> so hand this here. Yes. Uh, I know that Did we answer, did the, this is a question about the video. We don't ask for it to be as creative as possible. This is like, uh, you can't be creative. You can't, you can't, uh, yeah, but we... Uh, <coughs> I want to know what kind of video, like, can we use that now? Well, the answer is, I don't, we don't want you to spend a lot of time on production values. We want to be able to see you clearly and hear you clearly. If it means that you have the window open, the, the, the shade open, and the webcam on, and you're recording a piece of resolution, and you're telling us a really great story, that's what we want. We've had some students from certain countries who almost sort of make it a, a, a you know a music video with dancing in different locations and things like that. That's sort of crazy. <laughs> we just want people to really just you, know, you can get creative, but we ultimately want you to stick to the time limit and tell us a meaningful story. And Molly's about to correct me. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say because I recognize you've talked before. I was just gonna say that she said quietly. So the story is the most important, and I just said yes. Story is the most important thing. You could even I mean, you could take it on your phone like this. We just want to hear how you communicate and tell the story. I'm not present, but she process, but that's what I hear anyway. <laughs> um, okay. Did you sell your question? Go ahead. Uh, so, in terms of admissions process itself, is there, uh, so if you're applying for any admissions process, like a rolling admissions thing, or is it just a segment? That's a good question. Is it a rolling admissions, or is it do you can you apply early and you get answers? And so, in the previous, when, when I was by myself and I, it was very wild west, it was rolling admissions, it's not anymore. It's, the applications are due on February 1st, and we typically review those applications, I think by the end of February, right? And we usually start getting their uh, admissions out by early March with a, mm -hmm. a deadline to hear back from students by 1st of April, mid-April, April 15th. Yeah. Um, do, do we not talk, we had talked about some alternative admissions dates, we're not going to talk about that right now. Okay. No, so that's it. February 1st, get them in. International or domestic, and um, yeah, we're, we endeavor to get them back to you very quickly in terms of what the answer is. And then that is enough. Oh, oh no, okay. I think question. Um, so the question is, why does this program not require GRE or GMAT scores, which seems unusual for most grad programs? I mean, <laughs> Some people just Latin for punishment. <laughs> why no GRE or GMAT? Okay, I think I have is probably the best qualified to talk to you about the big picture on this, but what we you know, when we have required the GREs in the past, um, I would look at it perfunctorily, but I found that it doesn't really tell you much about the student. 
You know, this is such an unusual uh, area of concentration. And the letter of intent sort of outweighs everything else for me in terms of how the person represents themselves and their needs and how they see us. And the video is the next, and then looking at the transcripts after that. That the GRE just seems like it's sort of out of context with who we are and what we're looking for. Uh, and so, um, and I actually think that it's harder to, uh, people might think, well, maybe we're not setting high enough bar for what it takes to get in the program. Actually, it's not true. Um, I, if I don't read what I'm looking for in that letter, I'm not looking at anything else. And so our standards are extremely high. We're just not going to fall in line with what the world thinks those standards should be. Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> <laughs> um, And to add to that, I mean, over the years, there have been numerous studies showing how little the GRE actually shows. Um, in most cases, it just shows you, uh, it's a, a measure of what your grades will be in your first year of a graduate program, and that's it. Well, everyone gets good grades in graduate programs. So it, it's just not a useful measure. Um, it's also a huge barrier to admission for a lot of people, be that because of you know, test anxiety, or like I said before, it's a very expensive test. Um, so paying for that test, um, and it's actually a growing trend at, across universities um, in our department, one of the other graduate programs, um, a year after we stopped requiring the GRE, they also stopped requiring the GRE. Um, and across the university, there are more and more programs that don't require it because it's just shown as it's not a good measure of anything. And Heather knows what she's talking about. She's getting, she's getting her PhD in sort of education advising, so listen. Just <laughs> also I know and we get this question actually a fair bit, but again, um, because we're thinking about creative thinking in a professional world, Jerry indeed is a metric that might apply to certain programs, but the types of uh, skills and the type of class experiences that we have actually do not necessarily correspond with the types of questions and the style of testing that Jerry offers. So indeed, it's a growing trend, not just in Washington State, but all around the country, as schools are looking into better ways of assessing match with students, because someone successful in Jerry may not be actually a great match for a program that has specific needs. When, uh, when we did require the GRE, from the immediate time that I was the director of the program, I waived it for anybody who had 10 years or more experience professionally. This felt like that was so much more meaningful than some, you know, test. And so now I have bodyguards from the GRD Mafia's coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're watching. <laughs> Other questions? And we're also quite happy to, we'll be here till nine if you just want to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with any of us just to compare your, your thoughts or anything like that. Anything else online, Heather? Lots of thank yous. Oh, I will drop a mic if you want. <laughs> um, can, can we uh, kind of blend through, um, through MC the MCDM and the MCCM? Yeah. The question is, can you blend the MCDM and the MCCM? The answer is a little somewhat and then a lot. So it depends on what you do. So um, you're allowed to take 10 credits. If you're, say, you choose MCDM, thanks, you put the side. <laughs> you're allowed to take 10 up to 10 credits on the left and on the other side, either way. And that's usually enough for most people. Um, we also have some classes that are what we call track neutral that uh, meet the needs of both degrees, and you're quite happy and quite um, open to taking those. And if you're so passionate about what we're doing, and we've had some really amazing students who decided to do that, we have both degrees. It's not, I mean, each degree requires 45 credits. It doesn't mean you have to get 90 credits because they're actually overlap. So it's, I think it's 70 credits for both 80. degrees. 80 credits for both degrees. Um, but it's possible if you want to stick around and hang around longer in the program. And we found there are some students who have taken three to four years to do the degree, not because they're incapable, but actually because they love it so much, they see how much it changes over time, they just want to drag out the experience as much as possible and get discounts on software to see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I had a question about that. Could you trade between going part-time to full-time? Yes, or? can you go, yes, and can you go back? Yeah, absolutely, part-time to full-time. Um, basically, it's up to you to essentially say I'm taking two classes or one class. Do you have to formally declare whether you're part-time no. or part-time? No, we don't classify students as yeah. full-time or part-time. So no, you can decide how it works for you. At any given time, you want to say, you know, work is easy, or I just got, I'm not working there anymore, and we take two classes. So, so, yeah. yeah. And you want to ask your question? Oh, what's the average amount of time it takes someone to complete the program? The average amount, if you're full-time, um, 15 to 18 months. It's because you can take classes in the summer too. And so international students, because they have to go full time, they're usually done. They might start you in the summer and then they'll go to the fall, and they're usually done within 15 months. And then if you're uh, part time, two to two and a half years, it really depends on what you do. 
we're making sure everything's going. Exactly. We're going to know who didn't ask the question, you know, not all can. <laughs> Seriously, if anybody wants a book, you can have a book. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm curious, I, I want to, I'm, I, are you asking, are you, is your interest because you're interested in applying the program? Are you, uh, oh, yes. Inquire on somebody else's behalf. No, it's me. Those are really interesting. <laughs> your questions have been about diversity and, and sort of coming from different backgrounds. It was pretty interesting. I was, I don't know, I'm, I'm a teacher, so I was like, well, I don't know, I just wanted We've to. We've actually had a couple of teachers who've come through the program, and and some of them were working for the Valley District, and some of them have either gone into leadership positions with their respective boards of education, or some have gone into ed tech. Yeah. Um, and um, we have a really great relationship, for example, with Dreambox Learning, which is a mathematics software. I know the CEO quite well, and um, I know one of our students works for the competitors. So all that world we're, we're acquainted with. I think this is probably a good way to end it, at least for the formal part. And as I said, we're happy to have these more informal conversations. For those of you online, thank you for your sense of humor and for your questions and for joining us. We are going to have, because we understand that this is actually, there will be more questions along the way, we're going to have uh, at least three online Q&As, live Q&As, over the next couple of months before the deadline. I think the first one's with me on the 29th of November. And that's all on our website if you want to tune into that, wherever you may be in, in Seattle or in the world. Just ask any questions like this for an hour over 12, from 12 to 1 o'clock this evening. So we'll send out information, or you'll see it on our website. But thank you very much for joining us, and thank you, Jessica, for getting us, and thank you, my colleagues, for joining us. And thanks for those excellent questions, and yeah, let us know how we can help you.